thank you guys so much for joining me again. I think this is this is my third webinar. I think I'm getting a hang of this. Um, hopefully we can keep them coming um, as the year goes along. I'm hoping for an early spring this year um, for all those who are around um, the GTA area. It's nice outside. So let's 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 keep the positive thoughts today. So today's topic will be um, on TM grinding experimentations. Um, so what I will be discussing for today mostly, and for some reason my slides are not moving. So let's see. There we go. Um, so my lecture topics today, as uh, as I am, as I'm going to go through them and mention, um, we're going to focus on some of the basics, um, as I usually do on my webinars, to make sure to remind everybody that it starts um, just in the you know the mounting and the cutting is very important and polishing as you'll see as i as i go through what is dimpling and why and why is it important and mostly i'm going to focus on how it's done so that's the experiment ex experimentation side of it um i will be focusing mostly on the one dimple and i'm milling process because uh the double-sided dimple is pretty much the same as doing one it's just as i wrote in the brackets here it's just very very difficult because you have to get very very precise it becomes very tedious and uh, a lot of damage can be caused to the sample very easily so in sample handling um this is sort of like the toolkit that you'll need now a lot of this comes within uh with you know with the dimple grinder that you have so the magnetic um stage and the sample holder i'm going to call it a puck and this is an example of how you mount the sample um basically on top of this metal piece here and then the wheel would would spin on top of it. I'll, I'll have a schematic uh, further on about it. Um, so obviously gloves, I think that's my number one rule whenever I do a webinar and, and you'll see as we go through. Um, we're gonna mostly use kerosene for the lubricant uh, when grinding and polishing. Ethanol is mostly for cleaning purposes. Um, microscope slides, just in case you wanna flatten your sample a little bit when you uh, punched out your sample. I usually put the sample between two glass slides and sort of press them together make sure the sample is nice and flat. I'm talking about the, the three millimeter disc, right? So if you did receive a three millimeter disc already punched, sample is already 100 microns, right? Because that's that's typically what a what a dimple grinding sample is, is the three millimeter TM disc, right? Of whatever sample, in this case, I'm going to use copper as an example. Um, wooden toothpicks. So I usually use the, the toothpicks to apply the compounds to, to the machine. Um, but also I use the toothpicks to sort of get rid of excess stuff. Uh, diamond knives, just in case you need to do some trimming to the edges of your sample after cutting it. Uh, mounting, which comes with the grinder. Buffing wheels and grinding wheels. Um, one thing that I do want to mention for everyone in terms of grinding and buffing wheels is that they do have an application purpose to them. So if you have a sample that has a very hard matrix that, that is very hard to, to polish in general, make sure that you find the appropriate wheels and the appropriate compounds or polishing compounds in this case to uh, to accommodate for the sample. You don't want to run into the problem where you spend a whole day grinding and what you've been actually uh, destroying is your actual wheel rather than the actual sample. So you have you actually didn't even make a dimple. So keep that in mind. Um, I just want to mention that early on. Uh, wax, in this case, crystal bond. So I'm not too sure about the manufacturer of the one that we have there. So if you do want to know what kind of wax uh, I was using to mount the sample, so I, I mounted in a hot plate, but I'll talk about that more. Um, and the micrometer, which comes in the grinder. Um, and then obviously the polishing and diamond compounds. Okay, and again, having your own toolbox is, is so important, guys. Again, first rule, so every sample is very specific, right? So if you're working from something from an aluminum, to uh, a regular standard steel, you have to make sure that you accommodate for all the changes that the sample is going to go through, right? Um, bacteria, oils, and dirt, that has to do with the gloves. So please make sure you wear gloves when you're handling dimple, dimple samples, especially for TM. Any samples for TM should be, should be taken care of with gloves. Um, again, tool set and obviously good bookkeeping, right? I mentioned that all before and patience especially when dimple grinding you're going to require a lot of patience because you know things can go wrong um from experience myself you know you don't always get the first sample right so usually when you're doing dimple grinding because it's you know it's just a one sample at a time type of job you want to make sure that you have you know 10 12 samples ready to go if something goes wrong to one of them 
Again, just a reminder, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this slide. You can check, take a look at all my other webinars and um, in terms of you know, basic grinding and polishing. Um, one thing though that I do wanna mention from this slide is the very, very end. If you spend more time in the finishing of the flat sheet, so the way that usually works is the customer brings you a sample. The sample is usually a sheet of metal. You know, it, it's it's not standard. So usually we have to cut it and then we have to grind it down to the 100 micron thickness that we want. And then we grab that sheet and then we punch it using a hole punch, right? The three millimeter standard hole punch. And then um, that's when we begin the dimple and then we go further on to iron milk. So what I'm trying to say here is the more um, you spend in grinding and polishing that, um, you know, those two surfaces of that sheet before um, you actually um, punch out the sample, you'll, you'll thank me later, okay? The better the surface finish of the, of the sample at the bulk stage, the better they will be at the dimple stage, okay? And at the same time, you'll know that you'll have to spend less time on the aggressive wheels, right? You can go on into the polishing wheels and the mirror finishing buffing wheel. Okay, so again, a reminder for the lapping tool when you're making these, uh, these flat samples, you need extreme flatness for this, especially because you have to measure the thickness of the center of your, of your punch sample. So this is a couple of examples of a hole punch. Okay, I usually recommend the Gatan, so it, it, it uses more mechanical uh, spring force to, to cut the sample. This one here is more manual, so you could cause a lot of damage to your sample. Um, but in terms of that, of, in terms of the punches, just just be careful. Sometimes what I like to do if if I have a sample that's very um, hard is I like to put a sheet of a of a softer metal um, sort of underneath it. So if but you got to be careful because these punches, you know, they're accustomed to only samples that are as thick as you know anything between 100 to 120 microns. So you have to make sure that that you're not ruining your punches either. Okay, so you have to maintain that that thinness, right? So if you're around the 120 micron thickness of your sheet before you start the punch, you might be in the thick area. So I usually tell people to, to sort of hang around the 100 micron range, okay? And sort of to give you an idea of how small we wanna make that dimple, so that center of our arc, right? That middle piece is, we wanna to get to around 20 microns, okay? Now you can get a lot further at 20 microns is, is where I would like to take the, the sample to the iron mill. You can base it at your own judgment, of course, and every sample is different, okay? Again, the better the rough finish, the better the sample will be after we dimple it. So what is dimple grinding? So this is a great picture of the dimple grinder here, okay? Uh, just to give you a little um, overview of the parts. So we have the stage level here. So this has a rest and grinding position. So if you see the little hole here towards me, it means the machine is, is on the downward position, meaning that the cantilever here on the micrometer is active using the counterweight, right? So we're using our weight. So we have to be very, very careful when we're bringing down this stage. It retracts all the way up, right? So there is a, a separate sort of off position, but when you're lowering it down, be careful. It is a very, very sensitive micrometer. Um, you know, you can have moments where you've set, a, you set up your, uh, your grinder and you've zero the micrometer and then as you lower it down now you've lost 20 microns and then as you grind it through you, you come back two hours three hours later and now you have a hole in your sample okay a hole is really really bad okay that, that's something that we don't want to do when we're dimple grinding but if it happens i'm gonna i'm gonna give you a little tip afterwards okay it's not the end of the world if you get a hole is what i'm trying to say all right um the grinding wheel would go right down here Okay, we have a timer, of course, you can set a timer. So the more, you know, the more accustomed you get to the machine, the better you'll get at guessing the times. But I can say this um, very firmly with technology now, uh, this is a fairly old uh, grinder, but with, uh, with the technology now, you can pretty much have uh, a grinder that will probably, you know, set itself to zero, um, reset how much it wants to remove and then stop automatically. So that, that's some of the good stuff about the technology as we go through. So it's a mechanical thinning method designed for um, reproducible high quality TM samples. I would say very high quality, yes, with the iron milling um, you know, aspect to it. 
Uh, I would say the iron milling is the one that provides the, the extra high quality aspect to it, but you can get really, really good um, samples just, just by dimpling itself, but it would be very unlikely that you will find a very good area. Um, it has very precise indications, so the micrometer is preset to balance the counterweight, right, to make sure that we got very precise removal rates. Obviously, with newer technology, like I mentioned, very, very easy. Um, it's vibration free, right, for damage control. So th this, this table, make sure that you keep it away from any other stuff around it. So if you have a pump right next to it, that might, might, might cause some vibrations, right? So you want to be really careful. Um, so I say optimal here because not everybody has polishing wheels. So you can have just a grinding wheel and then uh, a, a surface finish wheel. So uh, um, like a uh, buffing wheel, but the polishing wheels are also very important, right? So make sure that if you have as many things as you can get there to sort of get that in between surface finishes, that, that'd be great. Um, wheels of different diameters for different dimple profiles. So let's say you were targeting a very specific spot at a very central position in your dimp or in your in your three millimeter disc, that's possible with uh, different diameters and different thicknesses of the wheels. Okay, so keep that in mind. Different materials, as I mentioned, for you know things with harder matrices, you know things that are very soft, right? So um, one thing that I do recommend is if you're using, uh, I know the standard is usually a brass wheel. <clears throat> excuse me. Is you want to make sure that you measure the diameter of your wheel before you start um, grinding something. That way, um, you sort of keep a notation of an offset of how much of your wheel you have actually lost versus how much you've actually removed of your material. So as you'll see further on, I'm actually going to give you a range of how much you should be when using certain compounds for grinding. Um, that way, you, you give yourself a little room for error because this, this process can become very artistic once you start getting to, you know, 20 micron thickness on your dimple. Why is it important, right? A key component of the grinder is that we can get very precise um, locations, right? Using, as you can see, the light microscope here to center the sample. Um, and the key component here is that it rotates at the same time. So it, it creates a very uniform sort of area. And then, right, as we mount it on the hot plates, right, it, it, it creates that bond. So one thing that I do wanna make sure is when you're you positioning your sample, when you're centering it, okay? is to make sure that the magnet here, which is this guy here, does not move, okay? Once you have it centered and you start your first dimple, it is, well, in this setup, I don't know with the newer grinders, um, maybe with the technology is much better at centering, but it is very, very difficult, practically impossible to get back to the exact same center that you've done on that dimple. So if I were to, you know, center the sample, begin the, the, the mill, um, and then I accidentally lock it off when I take a look at the sample again to check it with the light microscope, you know, that sample is now a problem, right? You're going to have different um, uh, surfaces now. You're going to have roughness, right? You have different points of contact now at, at, the, at the center of the wheel. So you have to be very careful, especially when centering. So it's very important because we can get very precise, but um, I'm talking about specifically this model of grinder. Um, you know, once you get that center, you know, one, one thing that happened to me before was just lifting up this light microscope here, I, I knocked off the magnet. So we have to be very, very careful, okay, when we're playing around with the dimple after we already began. So the way that the machine, I like to set it up, right? So this is this, this schematic that I wanted to sort of illustrate on how the grinding works, right? So the specimen mount, right? We center it, we have the wheel sort of spinning clockwise here, and then the grinding wheel uh, counterclockwise, okay? Um, the grinding happens right at the center axis here. Um, we want to, again, we want to be really careful when we lower down the sample here, especially when we get into the 20 microns, right? When we're about to uh, start the mirror finish. If we lower this down very harshly, you can see all of that weight and all of that pressure is just gonna, it's just gonna kill your sample, okay? One other tip that I, one other tip that I want to mention to you guys is always make sure that you start your grinding process as the wheel, as the grinding wheel is already spinning, okay? It is gonna take a lot more force for the grinding to begin than to the grinding to start, okay? So when you're getting to, um, you know, to when you're switching wheels, cause I recommend switching uh, wheels when you're going to, you know, three, uh, sorry, five, three and one micron, 
on your diamond compounds. <clears throat> just make sure that you know you clean the wheels and that you you know add you know brand new compound. Okay, don't reuse it. Very important. And also clean clean your sample as well after every wheel, just to make sure that those extra particles are are not there. Okay. Um, again, the sample should be measured be, be right when you begin, and then keep notation of how much you're removing with the micrometer. Okay. You want to start at a low medium speed. Okay, so something between three to ten RPM, nothing, nothing crazy. Okay, I would even say three, three to five. Okay, make sure that you check the micrometer. You want to do um, your removal rate check. So when you're lowering down your stage, right, the micrometer. So if I go back, I probably can't go back, but that's okay. So as you're as you bring down the wheel, right? We're gonna measure the thickness of the sample. So this is a little schematic of how you know the process should be, right? You have your your bulk sample, you get your uh, your cutting tools and your grinding tools, you get it to 100 microns, you, you have nice surface finish. I would even recommend one micron uh, surface finish at every at both sides. Start the grinding right at the center without removing uh, the sample too much, right? Because it's very hard to center again. Our target thickness is 20 microns, right? Um, I want to make sure that I, I, I tell you this, right? That you want to apply the polishing and 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 um, and the diamond, and then you want to measure how much you want to remove with those added, just so that you know how much to offset as well. Okay, so make sure that you measure your wheel, you measure how much uh, your wheel will actually the the micrometer will actually remove with the uh, kerosene and the diamond added to it. Okay, so then that way you sort of have yourself a little bit more thickness flow. Okay, so here's sort of the the grinding procedure. So you start at five, right? Go to three, and then you spend a little bit more time on on one and two, okay? And then you follow through with your buffing wheel, right? For that mirror finish, I would say 10, 10 to fifteen minutes maximum on the polishing, okay? And then this is a sort of target overview of the thicknesses that you want to be at for your material for those compounds, or at the end of that of that compound. So you want to finish your five micron compound at around seventy to eighty microns thickness of your dimple, then three at 50 to 60 and so on. Okay, I would say finish your, if you wanted to do two dimples, so turn around the sample and do the other face, I would say stop at 50 and then do 20 to 30 on each side with one micron. Okay, so only do three, spend a little bit, it's gonna take a little bit longer, but only do three to, to remove around, you know, 40 microns to the 60 micron target. And then turn it around and remove 30, you know, 30 to 40 at one micron. And that, that would probably do a good job for you. Okay. But you will have to IML, I think. Okay. It's a good idea to IML after your, your dimple grinds, grinded samples, but you can also electro polish them. Okay. But, you know, the thinness of that sample at the, at the center is so small that your sample might just be ruined. So um, IMLing. Okay. Um, be careful applying the paste again. Um, when you're changing wheels, make sure that you're very nice and tidy. You don't want to damage the center of your sample. It becomes very, very hard to handle once you start getting to the one micron line. Okay. And again, a hole does not mean that the sample is wrecked. If you misjudged a little bit, and let's say you accidentally made a hole right through your sample at around one micron, what you can do is you can actually take that sample, take a look at it in a light microscope, judge how big that that hole is right if that hole is maybe around 50 to 100 microns then you should be okay to sort of do a low angle mill on it to sort of make that hole a, a little bit larger target the outside boundaries of it put it on the tm see if you can get an area out of it um you know maybe you can you can see something right so not every sample can, you know can be thrown away after after making a mistake okay um, just make sure, and again, just make sure that you lower the stage while the wheel is spinning, just to make sure that you don't have that, you know, extra frictional force that's going to cause problems. I, I don't want to spend too much time on arm milling. Um, I did, I did mention arm milling before on, on my other webinars, but this is just a little overview on what it is, right? So we're sort of etching the material away with high energy ions, right? Making sure that we remove material at the same time very precisely. Now, if you have samples that are very sensitive, 
um, machines like this do have cold stage and, and uh, you know, a cold stage where you can do, you know, liquid nitrogen added to it. So you can see that here on mine here in the back, um, where you can control the sort of stage movement and the stage processes inside. Um, you can get uh, as low as one degree on these samples, but we tend to go to maybe two to three degrees. That's the lowest I think we tend to go. Um, and I'm going to give you some some other you know procedures on how to work with some samples after dimpling them. So again, there's a cold stage and the normal stage, right? So usually we use cold sample, you know, a cold stage for samples that are heat sensitive, like aluminum or some semiconductors. Um, iron milling, right? Already know in which neutral ion uh, atoms and ions from a cathode trench to disk at an angle. As a result, the atoms on the sample are milled away. Right, but the good thing about the iron mills now is that they actually have a, a, a laser sensor, right? Where after, because um, what happens is there's a light that sort of shines every so often underneath the sample stage um, that gets triggered by a laser on top, um, which indicates that a hole has now been made through the sample and stops the machine automatically. So you can get very, very precise, you know, stopping times once the sample is, you know, has is electron transparent. Um, some of the machine specs that I do want to make sure that you note before you put your sample uh, through, you know, a session of iron milling is calibrate your, um, your guns, okay, make sure you have reasonable outputs so that you're not adding, uh, you know, Aragon to the surface of your sample, you know, you're implanting Aragons because that's one thing that we have to look for when we iron mill. Um, another thing is that you're not sort of over milling your sample or that you're not, you know, causing all heat problems in your sample or, you know, making sure that you're actually milling with the right energies. OK, so just make sure that you take take a look at the at the machine first, just to make sure that the, the guns are centered and that the guns are working the way they should be. Again, um, the nature of the sample, the energy of the ions, the beam current and the angle are very important uh, to how much you want to remove in the milling rate, of course. OK, so usually I start off, you know, if the sample is around 20 to 30 microns, I usually start off at six degrees. OK, uh, for about uh, two to five, sorry, two, for about five to 10 minutes, sort of just to clean the surface, you know, if the sample has just been sitting on a drawer. Just want to make sure I get some rid of some oxides, if there's some oxides present or some particles on the surface, then I will stay, stay at six uh, degrees at six kV. I'm basing this on a steel. OK. Um, a hard steel, so I'm going to say martensitic steel in this case. Most metals you can work between four to five kV. So I would say, um, you know, most steels 4.5 to 5 kV usually pretty good. Uh, but I tend to go very aggressive on on my steels. I usually use six kV. Uh, but after the cleaning, you want to do six six degrees uh, on both of both angles. So you can either have both the top guns uh, facing upwards, and then after an hour flip them or have one in one on one side and then flip them afterwards. But I do recommend having some lead flow where you do come, come in and flip them or set up your iron mill to sort of flip the guns and manipulate the angles a little bit more for that extra surface finish that you want, okay? Uh, so 6 kV um, for maybe until it perforates, so until it makes the hole. And then I switch to sort of 4 kV at three degrees on every gun to sort of clean up the sample a little further for like 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, and then that should be that should be ready to to take a look at on the on the TEM. One thing about these samples is that you can actually have some lead way where if the sample is not good enough after you finish it, you can just easily pop it back in the iron mill and do some regular surface finishes there using the same parameters if you want, or just to manipulate them to, you know, the thickness that the technician, the TM technician gave you. Hey, the sample might be so and so thick. Can you do a little bit more on this in this area? Um, runs can take up from four to 16 hours. Um, recently working with a dimpled sample, um, you know, it, it can take very long, especially if you are conservative, if you only do the one dimple side. Um, again, you can always go all the way down. You can see in this picture, you know, there were two dimples made, one smaller than the other, which was my reference to earlier. But you don't always have to do this. You can be conservative, right? Just do one dimple and just spend more time on iron milling, okay? It will work out well. Uh, you might get some artifacts either way because it, it is a mechanical process throughout. So just see if you can gamble. This is sort of an overview of iron milling. Okay, just to make sure is, you know, make sure that you handle the samples with vacuum tweezers, don't handle them with regular tweezers. 
Okay, and be worried about the ergon implantation of the sample. We are attacking it with, uh, you know, ergon ion beams. So make sure that uh, you take a look at the material of the sample and know what can be, you know, what are some of the potential problems that can happen if we have all that heat and all the, you know, all that ergon and vacuum problems, you know, with the sample as we put it in the ion mill. So take a look, do some prior research. That's usually what I recommend a lot for people that watch my webinar is, uh, you know, when the sample comes in, try to expect anything. Just make sure that you do a prior research of the sample and contact the, you know, responsible person with you so that you collaborate a little bit more so that you don't run into as many errors. Um, and down here, you know, just a visual summary, right? We have our sample, there's a dimple, then we thin it, and we want to get somewhere around 50, 50 to 60, you know, nanometers thinness TM ready, okay? So just, this is a little overview and a very nice, simple webinar on dimple grinding and iron milling. And uh, I hope you all enjoyed it. Great, thank you, Joyner. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please place them in the chat. Oh, there's a question. Um, why are you using kerosene for polishing? Um, I found kerosene in this case to not have as many um, issues with cleanliness, and I, I feel like it is a little bit oily. Um, you know, it has a little bit more like an oil sort of aspect to it, so it gives it a little bit more uh, lead way in terms of sort of a little aggressiveness that I like to, to do to my samples. Um, but I think you can use any uh, alcohol. I like kerosene personally, just, just, just because it's a little nicer to work with in my opinion. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cause as many problems with, you know, drying too quickly or, uh, I mean, you can also use isopropanol. Isopropanol will probably do uh, pretty good. Just make sure that you use ethanol. I find ethanol to be better for cleaning purposes.